that will work. Great. Um, so let's start. So hi, everyone. Uh, I am Carrie. I am the uh, an assistant professor of psychology at UCL based in London. And I'm the lead investigator of the UCL Penn Global COVID study. I know that some of you on the call today have participated in the study. So we welcome you. Um, and also we thank you for um, all of your support and also attending to hear what we found out today. Um, this longitudinal study looking at the impacts of COVID-19 on our mental health, physical health, as well as relationships has really been, uh, I would say, maybe speaking on behalf of everyone on the call, keeping all of us very busy um, during the pandemic. Um, but uh, we do hope that there is something interesting uh, that we'd like to share with you, as well as also um, commentary um, from our invited uh, guest speaker today which I will introduce to you guys shortly, um, which we're very excited about. And so um, we really want this whole webinar session to be very casual and conversational. Um, however, we will start off with a kind of uh, more formal presentation for the first um, half of the um, hour by our team, followed by um, a commentary by Casley um, before getting to the kind of Q&A session of the, of the webinar. So this series is sponsored by the UCL Global Engagement Fund. And really the goal of this series is for us as the research team to share our study findings with the public as widely as possible. And um, we've also decided to invite critique and commentaries um, from the audience, as well as from leading experts in industry, clinical practice, policy, public health, et cetera. Um, this is uh, so that we can ensure the research recommendations we make can be applied to practice and that it really is contextualizing our findings a bit more. Um, and so this today is the first of a series of five talks um, and the schedule for the kind of upcoming talks uh, will be available or you can visit the links um, that we're going to throw into the chat in a second. Um, and um, today, uh, let me just introduce our speakers for uh, for a bit. So today I'm really thrilled um, to have a very stellar team really to kickstart our uh, webinar series. As you can see, all the speakers on the call are from all over, um, but primarily from Italy, Singapore, um, and also Kazi, I believe she's in the US um, at the moment. So uh, a real variety and so a warm welcome firstly to Kazi Killam, the founder of Social Health Labs. Um, there, she partners with, um, with initiatives on trying to alleviate loneliness and improve social well-being in both the U.S. and internationally. She earned her master's at the Harvard School of Public Health, where she focused on loneliness as a public health cause, or sorry, public health issue. Um, previously, Casley led a national community engagement strategy for Verily Life Sciences. She's conducted research on mental health and positive psychology and developed an award-winning campaign to promote empathy and kindness. Um, and you can follow Casley on her various socials for follow-up conversations after this webinar as well. And her socials will be available in our chat. And next we have our presenters and Stella research team, uh, as I said, currently based um, in Singapore and Italy. Starting with uh, Professor Gianluca Esposito, is, he's an associate professor at Nanyang Technological University of Singapore and the University of Trento. He is the head of the Affiliative Behavior and Physio Physiology Lab at the University of Trento and the Social and Affective Neuroscience Lab of Singapore. So his work really focuses on applying physiological, genetic, neuroimaging, and behavioral pro protocols in the context of infant development. Next, uh, Andrea, Andrea Bizigo, I hope I pronounced your name right, is a postdoc researcher at the University of Trento, uh, Department of uh, Psychology and Cognitive, Neuro Cognitive Science. He has a master's degree in bioengineering and a PhD in information and communication, communication technology from the University of Trento. Next, uh, Julio. Uh, Julio is a third year PhD at the Nanyang Technological University of Singapore. He's also a lab member of the Social and Affective Neuroscience Lab of Singapore. And he obtained his master's in human computer interaction at the University of Trento, Italy. 
Alexandro is a Path of Excellence master student in clinical psychology at the University of Trento. He is also a research assistant at the Affiliative, Affiliative Behavior and Physiology Lab. And in 2020, Alessandro won a scholarship for an internship at the Social and Affective Neuroscience Lab of Singapore, um, working with John Luca. So now that you know a bit about us, uh, we'd also like to know a bit about you and our audience members. We know we had a kind of warm up session, so we know where you're from. Um, but I'm going to now launch a poll just to get a sense of who is in the audience with us today. So um, I believe. You should be able to see um, a poll right now. Um, if you can answer that poll, um, two questions, that would be fantastic. Thank you, everyone. And so this is also a great way for us, not just the research team presenters to get to know you guys a little bit, but also people on the call. It's an, always interesting um, to see who else is on the call as well. So about... Um, 70, 80% of people on the call now have voted. So we're just waiting for a few more to come in and hopefully I can share that um, soon. Alrighty. Two more seconds and alrighty. So great. So I can see that. Uh, Quite 30% uh, between ages of 35 and 44, uh, quite a lar larger group, second large group in 25 and 34 as well. Majority of you are in um, higher education, but really there's a quite uh, range spanning from uh, nonprofit, primary and high school, as well as research um, and also networking. Thanks and welcome everyone. So thanks for that. Um, we are now, I think, ready to uh, start our first part of the webinar series. So I will hand over to the team for them to uh, take it away. Thanks. Okay. So thank you so much, Kelly, for um, organizing the, this webinar. And thank you so much to, to everybody in, in your team. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's a very uh, good experience for us being with you all. Uh, I saw that essentially there are people from all over the world. Uh, some of them are coming from places where I right now is like in the middle of the night. So we thank them like that was so for, 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 for being with us. Uh, the, the format of this uh, presentation will be kind of a, a, a very, very, very uh, informal. Um, and, uh, and the idea is that uh, we will give like a joint presentation uh, uh, with uh, Julian and Sandra and Andrea and, uh, and each one of us will present different aspects of, of the study. Uh, the, having said that, I also want to share that only one of us, which is Alessandro, is controlling the slide. So at some point you will hear us saying next, uh, and this means that we are going to go to the next slide. And uh, just we can go to the next slide. So be before starting, uh, you know, we are talking about the impact of, of pandemic, uh, and of course, this had, a, had like a very large effect on uh, on uh, our life. Uh, but of course, there are like some some positive uh, things that that we can take out of this situation. One of them is that we had the opportunity of walking and meeting at least virtually a lot of new people. Yeah? Uh, and, uh, and, and so uh, I, I want to thank uh, all the people that were involved in, uh, in this project, uh, many of whom we only met virtually at the moment. But we also want to thank all our participants that during the, the first phases of the restriction and the, the lockdown, they took the time. That, that was like a very difficult moment, but they took some of their time to help us with, with our study. Uh, so we are... We are um, Yes, uh, Sonny, and excuse me for the little one in the background, they just come back from the park and, and they are screaming. Probably they are now uh, done. Uh, so uh, you can see on this slide our, our uh, email address. Uh, we will make sure to, to post this on the, on the chat box. So if you have any, any follow-up uh, questions or if you want to get in contact with us, feel free to, to email us. 
uh, and I guess we can pass to the, to the next slide. So uh, why we did study, we, we will start working on, on, uh, on, this, on this project. Um, well, the, the, the very first thing that, that we want to say is that uh, um, we wanted to focus on the impact on, on restrictions, specifically on uh, knockdown measures, uh, uh, and see how this uh, uh, information were having an impact on, uh, on our life. Uh, pandemics are, are likely not things that, that happen uh, that, that often. So uh, we did not have like a lot of knowledge about like the, the, um, the, the, the sum of the impact on, the, on everyday life. We had information from some previous uh, minor epidemics. Uh, I, I, know, I don't know if calling them minor is nearly like the right word. Of course, those, those epidemics like SARS, MERS, uh, H1N1, and Ebola had like a very great impact uh, on, uh, on some people's life. But, but, but for sure, those were like sort of different from what happened with, uh, with, with COVID. Uh, um, but what we know from this previous epidemic is that there was like a, an increase in this of post-traumatic stress, depression, anxiety, substance abuse uh, on the affected population. And uh, be besides this like very strong psychiatric uh, syndrome of pathology, uh, those epidemics had also a very strong impact on, uh, on social isolation. Uh, Indeed, uh, we knew that like, social isolation is a, a, a very important risk factor for mental and physical well-being uh, as an impact on mortality and uh, cognitive decline. Next. So uh, what do we know about COVID and mental effects? Uh, when we started this study, there was like during the very first stages of the, of the, um, of the after the, the pandemic, uh, there, there, there was like very little um, data out. Um, we are talking about like the very first weeks. The, the, some of these, uh, these results, some of these uh, reports were from, from study from Italy, China, Austria, and Switzerland. Uh, probably many of you may remember that uh, um, after the pandemic started in, in China, uh, one of the first countries, probably the, the, the country that was hit the most at the very beginning was uh, in Europe, huh? was Italy. Uh, and so at that point, uh, there were like some study coming from, from Italy and these were showing how there was like a, a, a very strong impact on depression, anxiety, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, issues related to, to, to sleep, mostly sleep like disorders. Um, however, these early studies uh, showed that how there were like some factors uh, that were, were functioning as predictive factors. Uh, and these factors were like the number of friends and uh, the extent of the social support. Uh, so it seems that uh, be integrated in a, in a social support system, uh, this was uh, very important um, to sort of fight the effect of loneliness denied by the, the, the knockdown. And uh, based on that, we started like uh, with our research question. And the way we wanted to, to, to work on, on this issue was uh, to know something more about the loan of time or modulating the effects of the lockdown restriction. So in other land, we, in, other, in other words, we wanted to know how much the time spent in lockdown was having an effect. And uh, the, the reason uh, we wanted to know more about time is that, well, first of all, at that time, we didn't really know how long those restrictions were, were gonna last. Uh, in some countries, this restriction uh, lasted quite uh, a long time. Uh, and as you <laughs> well know, you know, there are like different sort of restrictions that are still in place right now. Uh, so we were interested in, uh, in, in knowing uh, the effect of time. 
And we wanted to, to work on two main levels. The, the first point was like, what is the aspect that is most sensitive to time? Uh, and, and of course, uh, we had no prior hypothesis or evidence from the nature tool. So we tried to use like a, a data-driven approach based on machine learning. And uh, uh, Andrea and Junior will tell you more about this later. Uh, and we wanted to find what are the variables that are most affected by time. And then the second question was like, uh, how does time modeling the, this aspect? So uh, we, we wanted to see if there were like some, some pattern or some variation based on the, on the variable that we were considering that they were changing uh, across time. Uh, because this was mostly like an explanatory study, we did like pre-registration of, of our idea before starting. Uh, and, um, and I will pass now the mic to, to Julio, which is based in, in Singapore. So it's in the middle of the night for him. And we'll tell more about the data set. Thank you. So the data set that we use for the study is derived from an online survey that has been conducted by the Global COVID Studies team, which investigated participants' physical and mental health during the pandemic that, as Gianluca said, we are still experiencing. For example, some of the aspects that the survey investigated were the quality of sleep, the presence of paranoid traits, the presence of depressive symptoms, and so on. Sorry, Julia, sorry to interrupt you. Can you maybe be close, get closer to your mic? I think some people are getting, finding it hard to hear a little bit. Uh, closer? <laughs> uh, okay, let me try oh, like this. Better. Much, Much better. better. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, fair enough. Okay, so in total, uh, the survey consisted of 359 questions and over 2,000 participants from more than 60 different countries voluntarily enrolled and took part in our study. As you can see from the map in this slide, uh, where the darker the area, the higher the number of participants, not all the countries received the same number of participants. Were not, the participation was not equal across countries. But participants were mostly residing in a small number of countries, including the US, UK, Italy, and Greece. From the original data set that we collected, we selected 12 aggregated variables in the table here that we believe were highly representative of different domains that include participant physical activity, mental health, uh, cognition, and living environment during the pandemic. Uh, next, please. Okay, thank you. So from the pool of completed survey, we had to exclude some of the data from our analysis. More specifically, we employed three exclusion criteria that are reported in this slide. So first, we excluded data from participants that did not give consent for data treatment or whose data were incomplete or missing. Secondly, data from participants who did not finish the survey within two days from their enrollment were excluded. This is because participants were allowed to start the survey, then pause, and then resume the survey at a later date. So to make sure that the data were representative of a specific moment in time, we excluded data collected over two days in time. Finally, to account for any possible bias, we excluded data of participants who at the moment of participation in the study were in a country different from their country of residence. So for example, someone may have been able to complete the study from the UK, but in reality was residing in Italy. So in this case, the data were completely removed. For each participant, we computed the number of weeks that they spent in lockdown at the moment in which they participated in the study. This allowed us to somehow compare the data of participants who reside in different country and that they face different situations. Uh, the lockdown did not start always at the same time. So for example, in Italy, the lockdown started around mid-February 2020, while in the UK, for example, the lockdown started almost two months later at the end of March. So by using this strategy of working in terms of weeks from the beginning of the lockdown, we were able to somehow normalize the data collected from different countries. Uh, what happened next is that um, we compared the countries for similarity in terms of differences in responses and number of participants. And we selected similar countries for our analysis. More specifically, we focused on the UK and Greece. While Andrea will give you in a few minutes more details about uh, 
I have a feeling Julia's bandwidth may be a bit low. Can <laughs> I think I can continue. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Probably I know what he was about to say. So um, basically by computing the, uh, the week in which the survey was completed, we were able to compare different countries and we decided to use UK and Greece because they, they share some similarity in terms of some, they, they had the higher sample size and they both cover the same period uh, of lockdown. So from week three to week six. Um, okay, so in this study, just to recap, we wanted to investigate the role of the time spent in lockdown in modulating the effects of lockdown restriction. Uh, since, uh, as uh, Julio described, we had a number of candidate target domains, 12, uh, we first focus on identifying the most sensitive one. To do that, in the first part of uh, our analysis, we used an artificial intelligence method. You know, artificial intelligence is not only useful to, to suggest products to buy on Amazon or, or, or to drive cars, but uh, we, can, uh, we can use artificial intelligence also to extract information from complex data. And this is the reason we use artificial intelligence in our study. Specifically, we trained a random forest model to predict the week of survey completion based on the aggregated variables representing the different domains. The main output of the training process is the most important variable. And for this part of, of the study, we only use data from UK. In the second part, we use conventional statistical approaches to first verify that there is a significant effect of time on the selected most sensitive domain, and second, to characterize how time influences this domain. For this part, we use data from both UK and Greece. And we did that to ensure that the, uh, the results that we, we will have uh, does not depend on specific characteristics of lockdown in the UK. Okay, next please, um, thanks. A couple of details about the machine learning part. This flowchart, uh, represents the procedure we use to train the random forest model and obtain the variable that represents the most sensitive domain. First of all, training a machine learning model means just that the model parameters P, typically they are just numbers in some mathematical formulas, uh, they are optimized to perform the task in our case, the task is predict the week of survey completion. Now, since the optimization process depends on the input data, there is a risk that the trained model performs well on the input data, but does not generalize at the population level. To reduce this risk, we adopted two key countermeasures. The first, is that we only use 75% of the UK data to train the model and kept the remaining 25% to test how well the model generalizes. Second, we repeated the training 50 times, uh, each time using a different portion of the trained da data set. Therefore, the best variable representing the most sensitive domain was obtained by um, aggregating the results of multiple training procedures. And the best variable is uh, perceived loneliness. Okay, thanks. Um, which resulted by long the most important variable. To give an idea, this figure represents the relative importance scores. And the importance of perceived loneliness is almost twice the second most important variable which is the difference between after and before lockdown uh, in the duration of mild physical activities. The mean square error of the machine learning model was 1.14 on train and 2.21 on test, meaning that on average, uh, the model prediction had uh, an error of about one week on the train dataset and a week and a half 
on the test, test data set. In the second part, uh, we focused on characterized on uh, characterized characterizing how the perceived loneliness is influenced by the time. Uh, for UK data that uh, we see in the figure on the left, we observe that the reported scores were lower for subjects completing the survey during weeks four and five, and then increased again after week five. And the statistical results reported here confirm what we observed. Now, for, for those of you, of you who are not familiar with the concept of p-value, and to all others, please close your ears, uh, these p-values reported uh, in, in this table are um, represent, uh, I mean, you may think of, uh, as uh, um, to them as uh, the probability of making a mistake when uh, we claim that there are differences in our data. And typically results are accepted in if the p-value is lower than 0 0.05. So first, the results suggested that there are differences in the perceived loneliness between lockdown weeks three to seven. Um, and based on these results, we then compared the third week with the others, and we found a difference with, with, uh, with week four, but not with uh, week six. So taken together, these results suggest that perceived loneliness decreased in week four and five, and then increased again after week five. Interestingly, um, we, uh, we observe a similar U-shaped pattern on data from Greece that are represented in this line. Well, again, we found differences in the perceived loneliness between lockdown weeks, and specifically a difference between week three and five, but not between three and six. So before leaving the stage to Alessandro, I would like to make an important remark. This is a cross-sectional study, not a longitudinal study. It means that we studied different subjects who completed the survey in different weeks, not the same subjects completing the same survey at multiple time points. That would have been more informative probably, but very, very difficult to accomplish. Still, I think that we have some new insight about how lockdown may influence the perceived loneliness. And now, Alessandro, is up to you. Thanks. Thank you, Andrea. So therefore, uh, from the results of our study, uh, perceived loneliness emerged to be the most sensitive domain in our mental and physical life, uh, at least for the first wave of lockdown. And uh, a counterintuitive pattern, uh, as Andrea uh, well explained before, uh, in particular, a U-shaped curve for its cause was found. Uh, this highlights once again the fact that loneliness and social isolation are two different constructs and uh, uh, quite, quite independent from each other. Uh, and this explains uh, why uh, we, we can feel lonely even when surrounded by other people and vice versa. Uh, as a matter of fact, loneliness is a more uh, subjective evaluation and uh, social isolation is a, a more sub uh, objective fact. Uh, from this perspective, loneliness comes as a, uh, as a result of the, uh, of the perceived mismatch between the desired social support and the support that we uh, received by the environment. Uh, this allows us to somehow uh, advance some hypotheses uh, in order to uh, uh, give meaning to our, to our results. And for instance, we can say that uh, uh, as for definition, loneliness is a, is a mismatch between desired and received social support. Uh, we can hypothesize that uh, lower levels of loneliness in the first weeks of lockdown could, uh, could signify that uh, people in that period of time was, uh, were receiving the, the social support that they desired, or even uh, more of it in terms of quantity and, uh, and quality. And, uh, and this is according this finds agreement in the in the emerging literature on uh, on COVID-19, as we previously said, because uh, one social support and one uh, number of friends seems to play a protective role uh, against the effects of uh, lockdown on uh, the sense of loneliness on people. 
Uh, nevertheless, there are other uh, additional interpretations that uh, can explain the, the result, uh, our findings. Uh, in fact, uh, lower levels of loneliness in the first uh, uh, period of lockdown could uh, uh, may depend on, uh, on other aspects that were not assessed uh, in, our, in our analysis. First of all, uh, the, case, the, the reported case number could have played a role. Uh, because uh, it, after one month of restrictions, uh, the the number of uh, the case number uh, of people affected by by the virus uh, was likely to be diminished, and this may have provided in the in the population a, a, a sense of safety and connections that may have, as a consequence, reduced uh, the perception of feeling lonely. Uh, a second uh, aspect is that uh, at least for the first uh, wave of lockdown and for the initial weeks uh, restrictions were followed by people's um, people's appetite to to meet online to organize uh, online events thanks to the to the platform to the digital platforms that uh, we have all used uh, in in this period of time and this uh, may have uh, helped reducing the the feeling of loneliness uh, in any case, uh, studying loneliness is uh, uh, studying the changes in uh, in the sense in the feelings of loneliness in in the general population is uh, uh, is important for several reasons. First of all, uh, loneliness seems to be connected with the one's concept of self, uh, the individual's cognitive functioning, and in general with the mental and physical well-being of the person. Uh, in fact, people uh, lonely people are more likely to suffer from uh, Alzheimer's disease, depression and suicide, personality disorders, alcoholism, and uh, sleep problems. So this uh, set of evidence uh, highlight the, the importance on, uh, of studying and uh, addressing uh, the feelings of loneliness in the, in the population when uh, we design uh, uh, policies that, uh, and restrictions that aim to uh, to stop the spreading of infecting agents such as uh, uh, COVID-19. Okay, back to me for the, for the take-home message, hopefully this time without background noise. Uh, so uh, probably like concluding this, uh, this analysis, the, the, the most important uh, uh, message that we want to show is that uh, uh, like perceived loneliness was the most time sensitive aspect uh, at the least during the first weeks of lockdown. Uh, and uh, somehow this is important to know because uh, um, we believe that uh, uh, perceived loneliness is something on which uh, we can work on. And uh, I, I'm sure that Kesri, uh, in, a, in a comment on it, will we, we, we tell us more about because she's the expert in the field. But the idea that we have is like that maybe we can use like this data um, to sort of uh, suggest that uh, campaign can be made to, to, to better social support and increase like uh, strategies. Uh, and these may be effective somehow in the context of social isolation. Uh, we, we aim to keep the levels of perceived loneliness low. And however, there are still like a number of, of issues. Uh, we are focusing here on, on the concept of, of loneliness. However, we know that the concept of loneliness is very like time and context specific. So are we really sure that what we are defining now, as loneliness now in the context of an restriction during COVID-19 uh, as the same futures of what we used to describe as loneliness like uh, just a few years ago. Uh, furthermore, uh, what, may, what makes very, very complicated to, um, to assess and analyze uh, loneliness is the fact that there are like, so many variations in terms of uh, factors such as culture, socioeconomic wealth, ethnicity, uh, they make very complicated to, to, to compare the findings from, from different countries. Uh, um, furthermore, we should also say that the, the, the kind of restriction that were um, put forward by different governments in different contexts uh, 
were very different. So uh, it really uh, makes complicated to, to, to compare results from one country to another. Uh, and even if we try to, to compare like based on the, on the weeks in lockdown, which is our way to, to standardize like this, um, the influence on lockdown, we still should admit that the lockdown restrictions were, were very different. And, uh, and in some cases, they really impacted people's life in order for them to be like milder. Um, and, uh, and then finally, we, I think we should also uh, acknowledge the fact that uh, uh, we presented some data here on the first waves of lockdown. But in many countries, unfortunately, uh, there were like more waves. Uh, in some countries, we are now on uh, on wave three of lockdown, uh, and uh, it would be interesting to know if uh, what, what was like the trajectory or the perceived loneliness uh, during these different waves. Uh, the good thing is that we now have the data from the three waves. Uh, uh, the bad thing is that we have not yet analyzed, at least from, from our side. So uh, stay tuned that we will be happy to share more with you uh, in the next weeks. And uh, with this, I want to end our presentation. And um, I want to thank you all for your time. And now it's time uh, we pass the, the mic to Kesley. All right. Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen all right and hear me okay? Perfect. Okay. Well, this was so interesting. Thank you. I really was reflecting on the fact that I wish all researchers would take the time to share their findings and um, engage the public in these learnings because I think it's so important. Research should not be done in a silo, and we really need to make sure that these insights are, are uh, available to the public and then being incorporated into the things that we do. So thank you. I, I'm just so enjoying this session. Um, and hopefully I can kind of bring a perspective of someone who um, has a research background, but also works on solutions for loneliness and thinks a lot about how we apply some of these insights um, to create solutions and to in improve people's sense of social well-being. So uh, there we go. So um, let me just get this is up. Okay, perfect. So over the next few minutes, I am going to, first of all, offer a few different reflections on the findings that we just learned and some of the other research that's been conducted on loneliness during the pandemic. And then secondly, I'll kind of zoom out and offer some insights into the landscape of loneliness even outside of the context of COVID-19 and some of the things that are going on in this space um, to address loneliness as a public health issue. And then finally, I'll offer a few uh, food for thought uh, reflections on next steps and what we might do with some of this information and where we can go from here. So let's dive right in and I'll share a few thoughts on the research thus far. You know, one of the things that came to mind when I was reading this study is that it's kind of a surprising result, right? I know that for me as a social scientist and someone who studies this space at the beginning of the pandemic, I was so concerned that loneliness rates were just going to soar sky high and that we were really going to have a crisis on our hands in terms of people feeling lonely and isolated. Um, but some of this research, some of the findings that we just learned about suggest that it's little more nuanced. And I wanted to share a couple other studies that also complement those findings. So one was conducted by Lou Chabi and colleagues, um, and they found that they actually surveyed over 1,500 people in the US at three different time periods. So followed the same cohort of people before the pandemic struck, I believe in February, as well as um, after lockdowns began and then during those lockdowns. And similar to the findings we just heard about, they found no significant changes in loneliness and actually an increase in people's perception of social and emotional support. So again, kind of of a surprising counterintuitive finding um, that raises some interesting questions. Similarly, another study done by Folk and colleagues last year surveyed over 300 people in the US, the UK, and other countries. Again, same cohort of people both before and during the pandemic. I think some of these researchers just lucked out and had um, chanced uh, 
having uh, already surveyed people in loneliness beforehand. And so they had this lucky opportunity to, to study people after. And again, these researchers found no change in people's perception of feeling socially connected, as well as um, on average, actually a decrease in loneliness compared to before the pandemic. So again, clearly something's going on here. Um, we're, we're able to be resilient and remain socially connected during the pandemic. So why might this be? Well, one reflection, as Alessandro spoke to, is this idea that social isolation is not the same thing as loneliness. It does not necessarily cause loneliness, right? We can actually enjoy solitude. We can also feel emotionally connected even when we're physically apart. And I think that this is a really important distinction and actually kind of a promising finding, right? Even, even amidst uh, isolation, we can feel connected to one another. And, and that's really a, an uplifting takeaway from these research insights. A second kind of reflection and takeaway is that we ought to really think about social support as a source of resilience, right? These interactions with loved ones, these relationships that we can lean into when we're in need of support or in trying times, these aren't just nice to have, they're not just feel good, they're actually essential. And we really should think about them as a resource that we wanna strengthen moving forward as a prevention strategy, right? In case of future pandemics and uh, for all trying times that we go through uh, in life. And to drive this point home a little further, this is a table from a recent uh, report called the World Happiness Report that was a global collaboration among different organizers organizations, as well as researchers around the globe. And one of the strongest protective factors that they found for psychological well-being during COVID-19 was people's social relationships. So more specifically, it's the quality of our relationships. You know, do we feel meaningfully connected to other people? Do we resonate with other people in a positive way? Also, the size of our social networks, right? Having a kind of a diverse network that we can tap into for different kinds of social support. And finally, engaging in different pro-social behaviors. So this is things like helping out a neighbor or volunteering or doing an act of kindness or empathizing. Actions like those um, really contribute to our psychological well-being and our ability to be resilient. So moving forward, we should really think about how we can strengthen these social ties um, to stay resilient through pandemics and, and challenges of all kinds. A final kind of quick reflection and takeaway that this study and the other studies in this space made me think about is that while our individual relationships with friends and family are very important, they're vital, we can also confer a sense of community and belonging to broader networks that we belong to, right? Here in the US, we saw a huge rise in mutual aid groups um, where neighbors would you know, reach out to one another and support each other. For example, if someone was unable to pick up groceries, someone else would get them for them. Things like that, where um, the sense of kind of community with the local neighborhood that you lived in was really strengthened. And I think it's important to recognize that that can be true in communities of all kinds. Perhaps it's your workplace that confers that sense of broader belonging, or perhaps it's a sense of togetherness with humanity more broadly, right? Many of us during the pandemic felt like we are in this together. We rely on one another to get through this. And that sense of kind of broader community can make us feel connected, even if we're lacking on one-on-one -on -one individual interactions. So now let's take a few minutes and kind of zoom out from these studies and talk about the broader landscape of loneliness, because it turns out that this is not a new issue. It's not unique to the pandemic, although the pandemic has certainly shown an important spotlight on this issue and therefore catalyzed a lot of innovation. Um, so you can see here a headline from The Economist a few years ago, loneliness is a serious public health problem. Back in 2018, the UK appointed what's commonly known as the Minister for Loneliness, and actually Japan just followed suit a couple months ago. And there's been a lot of talk in recent years, well before the pandemic, of this idea of a loneliness epidemic. And this is signaling the fact that prevalence rates of loneliness are very, very high in many countries. In the US, some of the most extreme estimates put loneliness um, at about two thirds or 61% of the population experiencing that on a regular basis, which is a lot of people, right? This, this is a common issue and we need to think about why that might be. Um, it also means that it makes sense that we should be a little bit concerned that this isn't just gonna go away when the pandemic ends, right? The pandemic has shown a spotlight on this and helped facilitate conversations like these about 
about these emotional experiences and what we can do about them. And we need to hold on to that moving forward. As well, it's long been known that loneliness and social isolation are linked to a whole array of health outcomes, as the researchers mentioned um, before. So some of these are kind of intuitive, right? It makes sense that if you're lonely, that's, that's not a fun feeling to, to experience, right? So it's associated with low life satisfaction, with negative emotions, with depression, with suicidal ideation, with cognitive decline. These are kind of, it, it kind of makes sense, right? We, we, we can understand these connections. But perhaps less um, intuitively is the connection with physical health outcomes, right? So disconnection is actually linked to lower immunity, to high blood pressure, to inflammation, even to heart disease and stroke. And then on the very extreme end, isolation and loneliness have been linked to a mortality risk that's comparable to smoking and drinking alcohol and actually a higher risk than physical inactivity and obesity. So I think it's really important to recognize that, you know, many people experience loneliness on a, base, on a regular basis, even outside of the pandemic, and it can have quite severe long-term consequences. So it really is an issue to be taken seriously. It also raises the question of what's being done about this during the pandemic, but also more broadly, and how can we think about addressing loneliness as a society and as individuals. So I wanted to share a few examples of that. And one kind of category of uh, initiatives that are being done or solutions for loneliness are different government-led initiatives, which is kind of interesting, right? So I mentioned the UK Minister for Loneliness and the, that Japan followed suit followed suit, sorry, with a, with a similar role. But there's also policy here in the US. We had the Strengthening Social Connections Act last year um, and other legislation at the federal level uh, to support solutions for isolation and loneliness. There are also campaigns and programs that I've seen a lot of in the US as well as other countries around addressing this issue and allocating resources to do so. So that's kind of one bucket of solutions that I've seen in recent years. Another kind of category here is around technology-based solutions, right? We could have an interesting conversation about the role of social media and technology in our experiences of loneliness. Um, but one thing that's uh, that I've observed in recent years is a really big influx of innovative apps and tools and digital solutions to not just you know, promote likes and retweets and things like that, but actually to design for more meaningful connection, for deeper conversations, for um, better ways of staying in touch with our loved ones. And I actually compiled a resource of over 160 startups in this space that are whose primary goal is to help people connect in more meaningful ways. And I'd be happy to add that to the chat after. So there's a lot of kind of innovation in this technology space to address loneliness. A third kind of example here is different healthcare driven efforts that, that tap into this space. Um, so increasingly um, doctors, especially in the UK, but more and more in the US as well, are screening for loneliness in doctor's appointments. So just as you might screen for weight or you know, blood pressure or things like that, screening for loneliness, asking patients um, about this topic to understand if they might be at risk. And then complementing that with the practice of social prescribing. Social prescribing is this idea of, you know, if a patient is isolated or maybe at risk for loneliness, to actually link them to different resources or opportunities for social engagement in the local community. Um, so this kind of idea of writing a prescription for social connection. And again, this is kind of on the rise in recent years, more and more research is being done on the effectiveness of this, um, of this approach. So again, kind of this healthcare bucket approach um, to loneliness. And then a final example I'll share is um, sort of community-led initiatives, right? There are many, many nonprofits in the US and the UK and other countries whose whole mission is to strengthen community ties, to provide opportunities for community engagement at the local level. Um, and this image here is from a program that I run through my organization, Social Health Labs, where each month we award $1,000 to a grassroots community builder somewhere in the US who's taking action to strengthen local neighborhood ties. And what I hope to um, illustrate with these four different examples of approaches is that there are many ways that we can think about addressing loneliness and improving people's social well-being, all the way from the highest level of government-led initi initiatives that are national in nature, 
all the way down to this sort of community-driven, grassroots, local, individual approach. And I think that um, to really move the needle on some of these numbers and the alarming rates of loneliness and how much it impacts people's health, we need that full spectrum of solutions in order to really change our culture around this. So finally, uh, last but certainly not least, where do we go from here? And I just wanted to offer a few kind of suggestions um, that will hopefully spark some ideas for the discussion afterward. So one um, thought, and I'm a huge advocate of this idea of prioritizing social health. What I mean by that term is that social health is the dimension of our health and well-being that comes from connection and community. So if you think about physical health as being about your body and mental health as being about your mind, social health is really about your relationships. And I think that during the pandemic, many of us um, have gained a deeper appreciation for our relationships and the role that they play in our well-being. Many people have experienced loneliness and it's really made us reflect on this idea. Um, and I hope that we can hold on to that as we reemerge, as we get vaccinated and are able to socialize in person again and kind of resume normal life. I hope that we hold on to that insight and deeper appreciation. Because really what we've learned is that connection and community are as important as other health habits like exercising, like getting a good night of sleep, like eating healthy, nutritious foods. It's right up there with those kinds of, of health behaviors. Another reflection for kind of next steps and, and things that we should do to make sense of these research insights and put them into action is to really plan for future pandemics and, and other kind of um, natural disasters or, or emergencies that we might face. Unfortunately, I think it's inevitable. We will encounter more pandemics in the future. And so in these cases, we should be ready, right? And, and so what does that mean? Well, first of all, it means including social support in emergency preparedness plans, right? What if every neighborhood at the local level, you were assigned one person who you are in charge of checking in on in case of a pandemic and one person who you can reach out to for support if you need it during a pandemic. And that infrastructure, that social capital is already in place so that when a disaster strikes, we're ready. We've got each other's backs. Similarly, to, to kind of plan for future, is this idea of addressing the digital divide, right? Um, as the researchers were talking about, Part of the reason that we were able to stay, you know, not terribly lonely and, and feel socially connected is because we had access to FaceTime and to Zoom and these tools for connecting with each other. But not everyone has that access. Not everyone has internet or laptops or smartphones. And so bridging that divide so that at the basic level, people at least have those tools so that they have the options available to stay connected. And then finally, more broadly, investing in social health as a preventive strategy, right? We've seen today that loneliness is, is such a core part of um, predicting long-term health and that social support can be such an important source of resilience through hard times. So how do we make sure that that's a core part of us as individuals, something we prioritize, but also in our culture and society more broadly? So with that, I've uh, hopefully that's a lot to cover in a short amount of time, but hopefully it sparked some ideas or questions you have um, and that now we can move into discussion and I look forward to hearing from everyone. Great, thank you so much, Kasli. That was a fantastic presentation and fantastic presentation from the team members as well. And I'd like to perhaps at this moment invite team members to uh, turn on your cameras as we open the floor up um, to take questions. I know some questions uh, and, and also comments as well for speakers who wanna um, you know, uh, have a look at those as well. Um, as people are maybe thinking and digesting some of the great insights you guys have shared, um, I'd like to take this moment just to um, announce actually. So as part of this webinar, we um, launched a social media challenge um, inviting people to um, submit a photo or short video or something that best describes how they stay connected. And as part of the um, uh, the social media challenge, we have um, a winner. And that winner, unfortunately, we didn't ask them for permission to share their uh, image, but I could safely say that uh, the kind of key 
thing that they've identified as helping them stay connected is, um, as Kathleen and others have mentioned, relationships. So um, that winner will uh, now receive um, a 10 pound Amazon voucher, which will be emailed to them. Um, but uh, for all of us, all the, everyone else on the call, if you'd like to pop in your question in the chat, um, we will start collating that and um, start the Q&A session. Uh, maybe I'll give uh, everyone maybe a couple minutes um, and perhaps even just as chair of the of the session start off with uh, one of my comments um, and kind of a discussion that we had uh, outside of this webinar and I think people on the call may appreciate this as well, which is the kind of falling along the lines of defining loneliness um, and whether or not this there's a specific kind of pandemic loneliness that we're seeing and is that significantly something you know that's something that is definitely significant and is here to stay or whether or not you guys think actually um, over time couple months we should really be worrying more about the people who were feeling lonely even prior to the pandemic. And now during the pandemic, this, these feelings have been exacerbated. Uh, I don't know who wants to take that first, but just wanna hear your thoughts. So um, yeah. I can jump in actually, just to kick us off. One thought I have is that there was a really interesting study done last year out of MIT where they um, scanned the brains of people who had either been isolated for eight hours or not eaten for eight hours. So they were comparing brain activity between people who were hungry or isolated and the same brain regions were activated, the exact same brain regions. So it was kind of registering in, in a similar way um, in the brain. And what's interesting about this is that just like hunger, loneliness and isolation is a cue, right? It's a cue from our bodies and our minds saying, hey, you're missing something. Like if you're hungry, you need to eat food. If you're lonely or isolated, you need to connect with other people. And so I think that it's also important in this conversation to think about the fact that this is a cue, right? And so during the pandemic, that feeling of loneliness is us saying, hang on a second, where <laughs> I need to connect um, in meaningful ways. And that experience outside of the pandemic might feel the same, even if the reasons are different. So that, that's one initial thought. I would love to hear others' opinions too. Yeah, maybe I can, I can add something to that because, uh, well, we have had, and uh, we know from many studies that uh, loneliness has a lot to do with the perception. So it's nearly about how we perceive it. And, uh, and then what happened during the restriction was that uh, uh, people were forced to be alone. But somehow this was shared among like, many people. So maybe, uh, I don't want to say that that was like a protective factor, but maybe the fact that people were perceived themselves as lonely, but also at the knowledge that many other people were feeling the same, uh, could they like play the lawn? Uh, and maybe the reason why we have seen like very, uh, like a very huge impact on, on mental health, uh, but maybe the impact was less severe that someone may have predicted at the beginning. And, uh, and probably, I, I mean, I, I don't know, that there should be like empirically tested, uh, uh, and, and I don't know if there is any way to empirically test that, uh, but maybe the idea that, you know, there was like some shared perception on loneliness somehow put the people to feel more together. Uh, it's like a, a like second step, like going backward twice. Uh, but but I, I, I think somehow, I don't know, in some of the like talking with people and, uh, and uh, having like conversation, uh, that seems like a very important factor. And then another point that I want to make, also looking at some of the, the, the questions that were uh, raised in the, in the chat box, uh, is that probably the effect of the, of the pandemic or the restriction uh, were very different in different groups. And uh, so uh, Casey mentioned about like the access to media and, uh, and I think there were like some, some point from, from June uh, that, that went about uh, like this. Uh, other points were like about people with uh, with uh, special needs or people with, with dementia that that you know may affect more the the 
the isolation and in general the impact of the of the, of the restriction. Uh, and um, and yeah, I, I I think that really uh, we can discuss about other variables like the socioeconomic status play a very important role. I mean, if you were stuck in a pre in a small tiny apartment with three very young kids uh, with no external access. Uh, is very, very different if you're spending your lockdown in a luxurious villa with a swimming pool uh, with your partner. And, uh, and, and so we, we can extremize this. Uh, and, and, and so, but we really should consider that uh, uh, we cannot consider like the effect of, uh, as a lockdown like a single unit, uh, but we should consider like as very like wide spectrum. Uh, uh, and uh, and probably what we will see is that uh, that those people that had like more um, were, were like having like more problematic uh, um, situation before the lockdown, uh, they may have experienced more severe uh, effect. Um, yes, that, that's what I want to say for now. That's great. Thank you so much, both. I uh, appreciate your comments and completely agree with, with Gianluca. Like, it, ideally, if we started the study, we it was pre-pandemic, that would be perfect. We'd get the <laughs> pre-pandemic, post, and also during pandemic. Um, unfortunately, I think perhaps a lot of the uh, existing COVID studies, uh, especially birth cohort studies, where they have the pre-measures, um, those would be fantastic kind of studies to look to. Um, however, the, I think the tricky or challenging part uh, would be that their measures are a, bit, a lot shorter um, than the kind of measures that perhaps we've used in our study. Um, you know, oftentimes loneliness is can be even as a concept measured in so many different ways, um, sometimes with just two questions, sometimes with 20 questions. So the even variability in terms of uh, studies and what measures people are using to measure loneliness can vary quite a bit. Um, and as researchers, of course, that's kind of what we are focused on. But it's great to hear the kind of um, applied side and actually how uh, outside of academia, how people are um, learning about or knowing about uh, loneliness and um, how they're helping the situation as well. Uh, I see that some there are more questions coming in, um, I think, in the chat box. Um, one, I think, that's coming up. Uh, this is a question perhaps to uh, Kasli um, about the ministers for loneliness. So countries are steadily appointing ministers for loneliness. How do you think social science researchers can best support the ministers in tackling loneliness in their respective countries? Yeah, that's such a great question. Well, first of all, I think it's about informing um, the ministers and the government strategy on what the evidence base is, right? What interventions have been studied and found to be effective. Um, but to complement that, you know, something that I've seen a lot in my work wearing both kind of an academic hat as well as an applied hat is that there's often a mismatch between the interventions and kind of solutions for loneliness that are studied in the research and a lot of the efforts that are going on in the world, whether that's nonprofits who run programs at the local level, whether that's, um, you know, apps and, and different technology tools, whatever it might be, um, sometimes they have data and kind of feedback and metrics to show that their their programs or products are working but that's not necessarily in the academic literature and so um, I also think that a role that social science researchers can play in supporting ministers for loneliness and other government led initiatives is helping to bridge that gap and really create opportunities where community builders of all kinds are coming together with researchers and with government officials to engage in conversations and share insights and identify opportunities um, to support each other's work and, and really kind of playing that role of convening and bringing all that wisdom together. Um, to figure out the plan to move forward. So hopefully that answers your question. Yes, and uh, next up, um, there's a question, really long one, actually quite a few in the chat that maybe I'll, I'll get the speakers to have a look at this one. Uh, there are quite a few, so um, it's general kind of thoughts, but I'll read it out really quickly. Um, Ella says, I'm interested in hearing how a study like this could attempt to measure perceived loneliness in kids and adolescents who might experience it differently. Just thinking of a young cousin of mine who's 12 and struggles with everything that comes with starting 
uh, puberty at the same time, as well as navigating friendships at this difficult age, having relationships moved online, pressures that come from social media, etc. I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm worried about kids and adolescents who are in such critical parts of development and have been affected by these extreme circumstances. What are your thoughts in terms of how we should be measuring the, these things in younger populations? Anyone? Well, I, I guess that's like, uh, that, that, that's a very important point. I mean, because, you know, we, we are talking about like young individuals where they are like structuring their identity, their personality, their social skills. Uh, and we know that though that comes with like social interaction. And, um, and in the question, uh, then is like an reference to puberty and adolescence. But I mean, I will go even beyond. I mean, even three years olders need to be with their peers. And, uh, and, and so I think in general, uh, the, the problem was, was huge. And I, I, I don't wanna be pessimistic because I know we have a lot of uh, possibility to adapt to different environment, but I am somehow curious to know and to see how this will evolve in the next five to 10 years. Like when we will see, like we, we, we can compare these kids that grew up and spend, uh, I mean, more than one year now having some sort of different like uh, uh, isolation and restriction and what would be their impact on, the, on their daily life. Uh, from, we already can see that already in, in some countries, uh, we've seen that the, the episode of violence among adolescents has spiked up. I mean, it's, it's really high. And uh, uh, there are not yet many systematic studies, so much, much of the evidence are like more anecdotically, but, uh, but, but for example, I, I saw that the, a few days ago, there was a, a, an report from the Ministry of the Interior that was like showing data how the, the number of crimes committed in the, in the age bracket 16 to 18 uh, is almost double than two years ago. Uh, of course, uh, we, we cannot be sure that there is any casualty, but, but it's, it's interesting that you can see this phenomenon. So what, what can we do? That's, that's complicated to say. Uh, something that I've been start saying, like probably like the, the, in February 2020 is like, uh, I think we should do our best to keep, to try to keep schools as open as possible. Uh, of course, that may not be possible everywhere, uh, but, 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 but for sure we should try uh, and probably we should have tried harder in some context uh, uh, to give the young individuals like the opportunity to, to internet. Uh, th that's one point. The other point is also we kind of should uh, work on the perception. You know, yes, we, we are now saying that it, it was dramatic but uh, I'm in the age bracket, which is more represented in this, uh, in, in this uh, call today. So the 54 to 40, 55, 44. Uh, so I, I wanna remind to every one of you, which is on my same bracket, what was like being when we were adolescent. So there was no internet. I mean, imagine a pandemic like that. I mean, the only way you were to communicate with the world was like using phone calls. Uh, and probably, I mean, I was sharing in my household where like four of us, like two kids and, and our parents, and uh, I, I can imagine like fighting all the time with the access to the telephone. And, but now in, in this context, uh, essentially kids were able to do like distance learning. Uh, they were able to somehow communicate the internet with their peers. Of course, there was a lot of vulnerability and, uh, and and you know, not, not all the families uh, had the same possibility, but in general, we had some possibility. So I think really in terms of uh, as social scientists, what should we do? Well, we should probably um, work on programs that, uh, that try to act on the, on the perception because the perception is, uh, is really important. 
So I, I of, of course, like having like live interaction, it's it's essential and essential. But if we cannot, because there are some restriction, we should probably train people and, and explain people that they should perceive that as an opportunity and uh, and there is some merit in that as well. Yeah. Carrie, I think I can answer one of the other questions and also get to this one if that works. Someone asked about who are the most vulnerable groups and who's in the most need of support. And I think that kind of ties into this question. If you look at um, other data on this, it's kind of a U curve in terms of prevalence of loneliness. So at the older age, older adults are, are more likely to experience loneliness and um, teenagers and, and younger age groups are the most likely to experience loneliness. So I think you're absolutely right. I share your concern about teens and adolescents these days, but also um, in terms of other people who are most vulnerable, some research has shown, um, so for example, people who live alone, people who have a chronic condition, those often predict loneliness. Also, I mentioned young generations, uh, men typically tend to be more lonely, which is interesting, um, and also residents of more individualistic cultures, which kind of makes sense. Um, so there is some data, I think a, a lot more needs to be probed there, but those are some insights from research on who's most vulnerable. And to me, in terms of what do we do about this, that says that, um, you know, we need to be tailoring our approaches to a given group of people, right? If we're, if we want to address loneliness among teenagers, we need to engage with them and come up with the solutions that make sense with and for them. Um, and similarly, other people who might be more vulnerable, we need to really think about um, tailoring that and, and in engaging with those groups in the process of figuring out how to, how to change this. Fantastic. Thank you both. And completely agree that, you know, perceived loneliness, perhaps that's something that is more subjective and more malleable in a way, at least from a, you know, cognitive and psychologist uh, standpoint, but also having these tailored programs that would fit um, our target audience. And essentially, you know, if we're seeing loneliness uh, and the experience of lone loneliness being quite different across ages, we're looking at kind of age appropriate as well as, you know, we have very diverse uh, international audience here, kind of culturally appropriate methods as well, I would argue are um, important here as well. Um, I'm just looking down at the questions. Uh, we've answered the vulnerable uh, group um, question. And were there other questions that other people, you know, feel free to turn on your mics or videos if you don't mind um, being on our recording as well, really won't be using this snippet um, at all. So feel free to um, engage with our panelists as well for anyone who, who, who wishes to. Um, oh, there's one actually question I missed here. Um, the idea of social identity theory, can social identity theory be applied to this kind of research and the research aims? Um, does anyone want to? Take that. I'm trying to look for where are your thoughts? Well, I mean, uh, I, I, so, somehow, yes, I think you can use like the, the, the social identity theory here. Huh? Uh, the, the nice thing about the social identity theory is that essentially you can use everywhere and any time because the idea that you kind of uh, tie part of your identity with the, with the social group uh, is, is very relevant. And uh, uh, I think, you know, the, the situation during the, 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 the pandemic, uh, especially at the beginning, was very fluid. And uh, and I remember I remember they were like uh, at the very beginning there, there were like this uh, this like huge spots where like we are all together we are redefining our identity we are all like fighting against something uh, we are gonna turn out better people and better countries better on everything uh, and two months later when uh, everyone was noticing that uh, we we were still there and uh, we still had restriction and uh, the cases were still spiking, uh, everybody started hating each other. And so we were not there together anymore. And actually it was like, uh, we are gonna get the, the, the jobs and the vaccination before the others because we deserve more. Uh, 
Oh no. There, there was like some some mentioning in the um, in the in, in the chat box about like some of the government uh were uh, like asking the question which should we save first? Uh, which was pretty dramatic uh, and uh and uh, like it was not like that common around the world. Uh, but so the idea is that uh, uh yeah but but on, on what do we base our identity? It's it's something very fluid and dynamic. We have multiple identities all the time. Um, and I think what, what, the, what, what the pandemic showed was that uh, probably even more than in other contexts, uh, our identities were, 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 were changing very rapidly. And um, so I, I'm not sure if I answered the question and I'm, I'm not sure, I mean, I'm not even an expert on social identity theory, but what I want to say was that I, I clearly saw that the pattern about like the feeling of in-group and out-group was, was changing very, very rapidly. And, um, and we, I, I, the, the idea that I had is that it was, everyone started with a very nice and positive attitude and, uh, but at some point the institution were very strong and um, and people start like facing the consequences of that and they started to be, let's say, not that positive anymore. Yeah, thanks, Shaluka. Oh, and did, Evie, did you wanna ask? I just wanted to add, um, because this year my students at university did uh, some research on loneliness and they looked at different factors that may be contributing and predicting. And self-esteem was one of the predictors of loneliness that was found. So it will, it's quite interesting and it links a little bit with the uh, social identity theory and how we perceive ourselves and everything. Um, and the other one that was very interesting was the use of social media and whether this is a passive use or active um, because uh, apparently those who use uh, social media more passively in terms of uh, comparing themselves to others, then they tended to be more lonely than those who used it actively when they commented and liked and interacted with other people. So I think there is quite a lot in there about different factors that may be contributing to loneliness. Um, and and um, the final point I wanted to make is that uh, we also found that resilience was a strong predictor of loneliness. So when we are thinking about interventions, um, and I know resilience is in the spotlight nowadays, uh, how do we boost resilience? How do we support people in different groups uh, to identify and understand um, you know, how uh, resilience predicts loneliness? And what we saw is that very interestingly, um, resilience was a strong predictor of loneliness in groups younger than 26 who weren't students. So in the group between 18 and 26, if, if uh, people, participants were students, they were more likely to feel less lonely, probably because of the interaction with other students and stuff like that. Do you think I should say anything? Sorry, I'm not sure who spoke, uh, but uh, yeah, it was quite interesting to see that um, the, the, the different groups experienced loneliness in a different way and resilience was quite key. Did someone want to come in on that point? I, I'd love to share it when I've marked the dissertations. <laughs> Did anyone else want to come in on that point at all? Jan, is it Paolo? If not, and actually, so if not, um, I actually, I mean, I did a disservice to also Sarah's uh, question on the social identity theory, even though I asked it really quickly. Um, obviously, I mean, I've read it more clearly now. And, uh, you know, her question really is thinking about whether or not those who have access to many more identities online or remotely, whether they would be, you know, they've been doing well, I guess, to, throughout the pandemic um, and have been helping them to cope. And that perhaps now as things uh, reopen again, uh, maybe FOMO becomes another you know term that people will be feeling again as other people are traveling again or engaging in kind of in-person activities and whatnot and I mean just on that point just my own opinion would be that I would definitely agree I think 
even the, the sheer number of virtual talks that we were able to, or I've been able to access and the great speakers all around the world that we're able to invite. Um, that alone, I think, uh, I, I do hope it's something that we're going to um, continue even after the pandemic um, to actually hear perspectives from all over the world um, and to engage with people from, from everywhere. I think it's so important that we, at this point, and especially a key theme of this webinar as well, is to take this time to reflect and also, um, you know, think about the the uh, things that have been really going for us as well um, and has helped us because we, I mean, a lot of the results we see or read or the news, most of it is negative. Um, but really, trying to find um, the the gems, <laughs> so to speak, in all of this mess. Uh, will be helpful, I think, for us uh, moving forward in, in thinking about a different lifestyle or even better lifestyle, I think. So uh, thanks so much for, for your question, Sarah, and apologies for having butchered so much of your, your um, question as well. Are there any, anyone else would like to ask our um, panelists any questions whilst you are perhaps uh, oh, we have, I think, one more question. And whilst I engage, maybe pass that to the panelists, I'm going to um, launch our kind of spinal poll. I know some people are maybe, uh, you know, in, in time zones where it's not possible to stay on anymore. But, uh, oh, and we have a question hand up as well. But if I can uh, just launch this feedback poll really quickly as well, that will be fantastic if I can get some feedback from everyone on whether this has been helpful interesting, if not, and how we can improve, given that this is our first um, webinar of a series of five. So we're, um, we'd love to hear uh, lots more about your feedback and also learn how to improve our sessions. Meanwhile, uh, maybe Renee, if with your hands up, uh, sorry for to keep you waiting, but uh, why don't you um, uh, ask your question if, if you want to. Thank you. Um, I was trying to figure out how to write it, but <laughs> couldn't quite get my idea into words. Um, I'm wondering about the uh, kind of, well, I guess the impact more broadly of the pandemic on um, the autistic community and neurodivergent community in general. And because I know that uh, the way we um, perceive social uh, con connectivity in a way, is very different for um, autistics. Um, I am one myself, so that's why I'm using this term, and for neurotypical people. And I wonder if there have been any studies done on this, or if you have any information. Great. I actually think we have some experts on the call as well. So maybe Evie wants to. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there have been, and I was just searching so I can put a link on uh, on um, on the chat. Um, there is um, our colleague Georgia Pavlopoulou has worked a lot with the autistic community, and actually she's also worked with their siblings and their families. And uh, there are quite a few pieces of very interesting research that have come out. So I'll try and put them on the chat. It's very, very, very interesting results and they are worth exploring. Yeah. Yes. And just to add to that, um, the uh, Cray uh, Center for Research in um, yeah. So they, uh, based at the U UCL as well at IOE, they have uh, run a lot of uh, studies as well during this time. So there might be some that might be a good resource to, to have a look at. Does that answer your question, Renee? I also, I also want to add yeah, to no. the name that uh, I just had a link uh, with, um, with a colleague of mine, which is actually based at UCL, the man and Dimitri, we are learning a special issue on the effect of the, um, of the pandemic uh, um, on uh, individuals with developmental disabilities in general, but there are like, a number of studies focusing also on uh, all this spectrum disorder. So maybe you want to have a look at some of the articles that are going to be published there. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you. I'm um, just going to actually just also share the, the poll so everyone can see. Um, thanks. Great that to hear so many people learned lots. Uh, maybe this will change uh, some of your, some of your um, work and lifestyle. And uh, thanks that I'm glad to hear that a lot of you enjoyed the talk as well and that you're very likely to see us all uh, or see, we'll, we're likely to see you all at future webinars as well. Thanks so much.
Um, so I have one more, I think, question in the chat I can see um, the from Siren, who says, I know we've been talking about um, perceived loneliness, but has there been any research on loneliness at a subconscious level, if there is such thing, and or the behavioral profile of loneliness and how they're affected by the pandemic? For example, during the lockdown, I was living alone and I was, wasn't initially bothered by feeling lonely, but needed to keep a voice of any kind, so like music or videos playing all day long. Then it suddenly struck me that maybe I'm feeling quite lonely or that I was trying to brush off that feeling. Would be interested to learn more about this. Do, do panelists know of any uh, studies looking at this? Maybe not, that's fine too. <laughs> I think that this uh, probably refers a little bit to feeling lonely versus being alone. Mm -hmm. And maybe I would look at this relationship and how there is a difference in between. Because you may be uh, among many, many people and feel alone. Uh, and you may be, you know, really alone and feel lonely or not. So I think there are some differences among, um, among these feelings. So, yeah, so to wonder whether you're feeling lonely, I think maybe it's a bit too conscious. Yes, maybe. <laughs> but, uh, it's worth exploring and, yeah, questioning. I would say it's interesting in that question also the kind of having the insight to recognize that you're lonely or alone, I think it's, it's important to, <laughs> to make that distinction um, yourself. Oh, and we have a hands up from uh, Natalie. Hi, first of all, thank you so much for this. This has been really, really fantastic. Um, I just have a quick question. My background is in single parenthood, specifically single mothers. And I was wondering if you know of any relevant research um, focusing on how single parents have um, dealt with the pandemic. How has it been for them in many aspects, um, it's specifically in kinship. kinship. Um, many single parents heavily rely on parents, friends, grandparents. Um, and without that support during this time, I'm wondering how how that's been um, in in any in any country. I mean, my research is usually in Europe, but I'm just wondering generally in any country if you have any research on that. Right. Um, very interesting question. Um, off the top of my head, I know in our data set, at least we do um, have or we can look at people to see whether or not they're single parents or parents with children, et cetera, et cetera. We haven't gone to that data yet. And there are quite a few people working on various uh, questions. So the, the data is there. So potentially we could look at it. Um, if, you know, if you're interested, you can definitely email me uh, further in the future. Um, but in addition, I, I know of one uh, study, a COVID study that's taking place in Cambridge um, with my old kind of uh, lab uh, uh, principal investigator and they're looking at different family forms and how those are uh, being affected by the pandemic as well, which maybe um, will help, you know, is, is along the lines of your interests. So um, if you shoot me an email, I can send that uh, link along uh, as well. Hope that was helpful. Anyone else uh, have any suggestions? We're coming, actually. I'll just say, I know um... There's a lot of apps that I've seen come up that are designed for new moms or parents, new parents, because that can be a very isolating experience. And certainly, especially in the pandemic, you know, uh, many of my friends who've given birth or, or are parents during this, it's, it's been a real struggle anecdotally. Um, but I just kind of talking about solutions for parents, I've seen a lot of different apps that specifically are about creating community and, and nurturing social support among new moms and, and new parents in general. Great. That, uh, I think everyone ended up warming up and there were loads of uh, questions in the end. Uh, thank you everyone on the call who has um, helped also answer our question. You guys, especially for also the panelists, um, everyone else who's contributed to the uh, chat. Thank you so much. We've actually come to the end of our um, webinar, which we thought might be might have been too long. So I guess now we know it's actually a good, good, good length of time. Um, to engage. But um, as I say, you know, just to wrap up, don't, uh, you know, let these conversations end. I think if anything, this is just a start. And I'm so happy that so many of you were able to engage and meet us even virtually um, all around the world. So this is fantastic. 
thanks again for also, also my students in the background helping me moderate the whole session. So thank you everyone and I hope you enjoyed it. Do stay in touch and join us in a future webinar series. Um, the next one actually in two weeks time is going to be me speaking. Uh, loneliness features in it a little bit. So if you're interested in continuing the conversation, definitely attend um, and I will see you there. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Um, I'm gonna stop recording. <laughs>